Welcome back to Film Talk Weekly. I'm Jacques Paisner here with co-host Gary Farmer, and we're talking to screenwriter Edward Kamara. Hello. Ed, you got any good uh, mule riding stories? Do I have any good mule riding? Oh, I don't know that you really want to get me started with that, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I do, but <laughs> we should talk maybe about the screenwriting first. <laughs> or I'll just take up the I'll take up the whole time with the new writing stories. So Ed, the the year is 1985. Um, you've got two major motion pictures coming out. Uh, one from Fox uh, with Enemy Mine, and the other from uh, Warner Brothers with uh, Lady Hawk. Yeah. And um, so, uh, kind of take us back there and tell us. Who you were in those days and uh was I, i'm guessing it was a very exciting time uh to have these two big movies that you've uh you wrote the screenplay uh for enemy mine it was based on a novella but uh lady hawk was your story as well if i'm understanding right lady hawk <clears throat> excuse me lady hawk was my story um and i had you know i would say this to to beginning screenwriters you know people coming along and i had really kind of it, that, in those days, that was before computers. And when you wanted to, when you, you know, you finally got an agent, you wanted to get your screenwriters, uh, your screenplays out. You, in LA, you took them where I lived at the time. You took them to a place called Barbara's Place, which was on Sunset Boulevard. And you got them uh, typed up and you got them kind of mimeographed and copied. Uh, and then you could send them out. Everything was, was hard copy. And when you walked into the room there, I mean, it was a big room and there were just rows and rows of desks with people frantically typing away. And uh, so I brought, I brought the screenplay and they said, okay, this, this will be ready on Friday, whatever the day was, I said, thanks. So I call up on Friday and I say, is, is it ready? And the gal says, yeah, but can we keep it till Monday? And I said, why? She said, some of us haven't read it yet. <laughs> and at that moment, a light went on like this one works, you know, <laughs> this one works. Um, and, and it was, it was a big change in my life, you know, when I, when I teach and I tell students, um, you know, you can hear no a thousand times. You only have to hear yes once for your life to change. And, uh, and so, you know, that was pretty quickly optioned up by Warner Brothers, uh, and, uh, you know, I started getting calls immediately. Do you want to work on this? Do you want to work on that? And the thing that really attracted me was this uh, uh, kind of novella. It was, I think it was 80 some pages long by Barry Longyear, which was Enemy Mine. Uh, and the, the kind of, the, if there was a problem with, uh, with that story is that it didn't really have an ending. It was sort of the story, if you know the movie at all, you know, the, the, space warrior that uh, shoots down the alien warrior over a planet and they have to survive together. I mean, I think it was kind of based on uh, Hell in the Pacific. You guys know that film? I think it was inspired, shall we say, by Hell in the Pacific. That's with uh, Toshiro Mifune? Yeah, and uh, yeah, can't think of the other actor's name right now. It'll come to me. Um, but uh, anyway, so, uh, but it didn't have an ending. You know, he had to, the... Uh, the alien sort of is a hermaphrodite in the story and has the child and dies. And, and so the human warrior has to raise this alien child. And, uh, and then all of a sudden they're sort of rescued and it ended there. If I remember the story, right. And it was by Barry Longyear, a science fiction writer. And so what sort of my job was at the time to, to find a, a conclusion for it. And the, the thing that I thought of was that the, uh, the planet they're on is found by these space miners who are kind of basically, you know, uh, criminals. And, and uh, they, uh, they, I forget exactly myself even right now, but they, they kidnapped the space child, uh, the, the, uh, the little drac, they were called dracs. They kidnapped the little drac and our hero has to, has to save the drac and, 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 and recover and take him back home to his home planet. So in essence, the, the, the theme of that story is you can learn to love your enemy. I mean, it's, it's this 
as simple a theme, a theme as that. But it, the original story didn't have that ending. It didn't have any conflict at the end. So those kind of space miners, I forgot the name I gave them, um, what I called them, but they, uh, they were the conflict really, you know, the, the, the created all the tension, the created all the tension at the end. The film was directed by Wolfgang Peterson, who, uh, of course, we all know from Das Boot. Yeah. And uh, I think that must have been uh, pretty exciting, um, knowing that somebody who, um, you know, was such a master of, you know, creating a world was uh, doing the project. Well, there's a big story behind that. Because the original director was not Wolfgang Peterson. The original director hired to do that was a British director called, named Richard Longcrane. Um, and he's done a few things before and, and, and after that. And, and he, he was one of these uh, uh, very energetic, very energetic young guys at the time. You know, I mean, he had a big earring in his left ear when, when that was almost, you know, unheard of and uh, uh, just was a guy with endless flows of ideas and so on and brilliant storyteller and everything. Um, and we worked for a long time. I spent a lot of time in London working with him, rewriting the screenplay uh, over and over and over and over, building it. And, and then he wanted to shoot in uh, Iceland. He did not want to use a soundstage. He wanted to shoot in Iceland. So, you know, the actors were hired, the same actors, Dennis Quaid, Lou Gossett, uh, and off we went to Iceland, and it proved to be almost an impossible shoot. The light would change. As soon as they set up a shot, the light would change. They'd have to move things around. Um, and, and Richard Longcrane was a guy who, if he liked you, uh, you could do no wrong. If he didn't like you, he was, he was very tough. He was very tough. And the, the line producer was a guy named Stan O'Toole. And he, he and Stan O'Toole were at endless loggerheads. And one day O'Toole comes to me and he says, we've got to take out some scenes. You've got to make some changes here. We're way over budget. And I went to Long Crane and I, I said, we've got, to, we've got to do something here, Richard. And he says, no, we're not doing anything. We're not changing anything. And two days later, they let him go. And the whole project shut down. And something like $18 million was, the film was tossed away. Um, and, and, you know, it was all back to the studio. And I thought that was the end of it. I thought that the movie would never get made. And then they hired Wolfgang Peterson and started over, started over from scratch, literally, in, uh, in the Munich, at the Bavaria studios. And it was all about the designing the characters all over again, the same actors, hiring the same actors, but designing the characters over again, building the sets. Almost all of that film was shot on a soundstage that they built and called it the Wolfgang Peterson soundstage. They built that just originally to shoot Enemy Mine. Now I understand it's called something else and you know, because it's been used for other, for other things. But uh, yeah, do you remember taken, the... Uh, it must Sorry. have taken uh, Lou, Lou Gossett hours to put that makeup back in 85 on. It was, it was very tiring for him and, it, and it, uh, it had a real problem for his eyes, he was saying. It had a real problem for his eyes because his eyes were always kind of sore and red and so on. And uh, I remember one time walking on the set on the, in the studio lot and my family had come out, my little uh, four-year-old, then four-year-old daughter is walking along and along comes Lou in this whole drac makeup. And she's a four-year-old and she, her eyes are getting big and she's like this. And only he didn't have these monster gloves on. So I quickly grabbed his hand. I said, look, see human hand, that's a person in there, a person in there. And she was like, you know, she was, she was, he was scared. Uh, but you know, and, and that's that's where the rest of the film then was shot and uh, and, and and finished. But doesn't story really story doesn't really end there. I don't know how much do you want me to tell about this one movie? You know, uh, I I'd love to keep talking about it. Um, I know that uh, we make we can cut this part out. You know, I know it wasn't a huge commercial success, but I think it did become a cult classic. 
Um, and um, we'll, we'll cut there and I'll say to you, we'll start with me saying to you, um, you know, Ed, I know you're uh, the kind of guy who really believes in tolerance and, uh, you know, the, hum the humanity of people. Is that something that you got a chance in this script to really tell us a lot about yourself and about your own philosophy? In, in Enemy of Mine, you mean? Yeah, yes. Well, uh, I don't know about if telling about myself. I think what really attracted me to the story was, was its theme. You know, it's theme that, that you could learn to love your enemy. I mean, important themes are often very simple, I think. And it was, it was really just as, as simple as that, that you could learn to love your enemy. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's, uh, that's, I don't know how to go, go further with that. That's, that's what did attract me to it. And it's, you know, it was based on a very simple notion of, you know, just two individuals. So it was very, it was very easy to uh, to create situations where you know uh, where the human played by Dennis Quaid talks to the to the alien about Mickey Mouse, and Mickey Mouse because Mickey Mouse is some kind of a legendary godlike figure in his mind because he had no associations you know or it it was they they had no associations with uh, Mickey Mouse uh, this. Uh, creature and so you, there were a lot of opportunities to talk about uh, oh the, this would I can tell you another story that plays into this that after the film was shot and edited I get called back to Germany and he says the most important thing where the drac talks about its philosophy doesn't work the snow was styrofoam and it's sticking to the makeup and it's an unbelievable so you got to find a place where we can put in this critical scene and if you look at the movie there was a scene where they're just walking through the snow trying to escape i think it was even doubles you know that they were using there you know they're walking into the mountains and it's blowing and it's all of this and you can't see their mouths so i said well you gotta well, we can put it in there we can put it in there. And so all of this Drax philosophy, which is essentially a philosophy of tradition and tolerance, um, is put in this scene where they're fighting snow and icicles falling on them and all of that. And by God, it worked, you know? It worked, I think, better than the original close-up stuff that had been shot. So uh, that was fun, too. Yeah, and I, I know that a uh, line about Mickey Mouse became one of the most uh, iconic lines in the movie. Um, we'll be back. This is Film Talk Weekly. We'll be back with uh, screenwriter Edward Kamara. <laughs>